welcome to First Baptist Church this morning. We're so glad that you're here. Uh, but we're going to do th- something a little bit different this morning. Uh, I don't know if you heard or not, uh, but last or yesterday, uh, Pastor Tommy's father passed away. And I would like to spend just a couple seconds of prayer, in prayer, for Pastor Tommy and his family. Uh, so if you join me in prayer, let's pray for him and his family. Dear Lord, I thank you for this church and for your love for us. God, I thank you for the love that you have for our town. And God, I thank you that you've placed that love for our town in our hearts. But Lord, also our leader, uh, our pastor is hurting this morning. And so Lord, we ask that you will give him peace, give him the strength to do and make decisions that need to be made. And Lord, above all else, please let him know above uh, many other things that Lord, we love him and the people of this church love him and will support him through anything. And so God, I, I thank you for him. I thank you for his influence on us. I thank you for his leadership. And Lord, please help us to, to minister to him through this time. Lord, we pray all these things in your name. Amen. Well, it's really good to be here this morning with you, and uh, we're going to be in Deuteronomy. So that's uh, in the Old Testament. Uh, Deuteronomy is not one of those books that probably gets read a whole lot, uh, because when we think of the Ten Commandments and we think of the laws that God gave to Moses, we usually think of Exodus as the key point for that. So if you're wanting to look for the laws of God and the commands of God, typically you will go to Exodus to find those. And we know Exodus 20 has the Ten Commandments, and I'm sure most of you could probably recite those much better than I could. But not, Exodus is not the only place that God gave us those commands. You see, in Deuteronomy, it's considered to be the second telling or the second commands. It's God reiterating and restating those commands that he gave Moses on the mount. And the reason he does that is because he wants Israel to constantly be reminded. If you think about a father or a mother teaching their children, do you just teach them something one time? Well, no, you say it at least twice, sometimes more than that. And so Deuteronomy is is kind of that idea. It's that second telling or the reinforcing of what God has already told Israel in Exodus. And so as we go through the beginning of Deuteronomy, if you flip through your Bible, you'll see that it goes through some of the commands. It goes through some calls to obedience. It gives a little bit of history of their journey through Seir, also as they defeat Moab and and Bashan. And so it gives a little bit of history, but then it calls Israel to come to obedience in chapter 4. And God's calling Israel to come together and to be obedient to all of his commands. Well, you can't call somebody to be obedient to your commands if you don't remind them what they are. So as he goes into chapter five, he goes through and he retells the 10 commandments. Moses is reminding the people of Israel that you need to be obedient to God. And these are the top 10 things, the 10 things that God says you must do if you call yourself mine. But it doesn't just stop there. You see, the 10 commandments are just a list of things of what you either have to do or what you shouldn't do. Those 10 things by themselves are still lacking something weighty. They're still lacking something that would bind them all together. And the reason why is because the 10 commandments are just, they're basically goody two shoes types of things. You know, don't don't go commit murder. Don't go steal. Honor your father and your mother. These are just things that a typical good moral person would probably do. And so how does this all tie into God? These are just a reflection. They're a Um, you know, like a presence, because these things are here, we know that something else exists. And so in chapter six of Deuteronomy, that's exactly what's happening. God is now demonstrating why these 10 commandments are there. What is actually above those? What is more powerful? What is the whole reason we have these 10 commandments? And if you look at chapter six in Deuteronomy, looking at verse one, Moses gives an introduction to what he's about to say. And he's coming back through the Deuteronomy of of the beginning of the chapter, and he's transitioning into what's going to happen in verse 4. And he says the following in in chapter 6, verse 1. It says, This is the command, the statutes and ordinances, the Lord your God has instructed me to teach you so that you may follow them in the land you're about to enter and possess. Now I want to pause there for just a moment and kind of set the scene. You know, when you're watching a movie or you're hearing a story, you like the scene to be set. You want to know what's happening around. You want to know what time, what place, what things are happening. And so here's the setting for these, this command that's about to happen. Notice it says, this is the command, and then it's not a singular thing, and then it says, the statutes and ordinances. Well, that, 
some people just kind of read over that and they don't really look at it. But here's the setting for what's about to come. You notice that this one command that we're about to hear is the overall pinnacle, the, the thing that we must be doing as believers. This one command. And included within that command are the statutes and ordinances within that. So you can think of the Ten Commandments and all the laws of Moses to be included in those statutes and ordinances. But they all fall under subjection of this one command that's about to come. And as we keep reading in verse 2, it says, Do this so that you may fear the Lord your God all the days of your life by keeping all his statutes and commands I'm giving you, your son and your grandson, and so that you may have a long life. Listen, Israel, and be careful to follow them so that you may prosper and multiply greatly because Yahweh, the God of your fathers, has promised you a land flowing with milk and honey. You see, the Ten Commandments and the statutes and the law of Moses, these aren't the only things that Israel is supposed to do. They are to be doing something that's even greater than that. All the Ten Commandments will fall under that. And the whole reason that God gives them the Ten Commandments and gives them the great command is so that they can, what does it say? Live long in the land so they can take control of it, so they will get the inheritance that God has promised them. It all comes down to obedience. And I don't know about you, but sometimes it's hard to obey. If you think about your children, your grandchildren, you ask them to do something or tell them to do something, and you blink twice and they're doing something completely different and they never once did the thing that you asked them to do. And so the same idea is here. God is giving us these ordinances so we know what we must do to follow him correctly. And as we begin in verse 4, the thing that you need to write down first is that we must love God. The name for God in the Old Testament, God's name is Yahweh. We are to love Yahweh. God gave them his name so that they could differentiate between him and every other God that was on the planet. And he wanted them to know specifically that you must love God. Now the question is, you know, it's easy to love, right? You know, I, I love college football. I love a nice juicy burger, right? Amen. I love a big, thick ribeye. Perfectly cooked to medium, seasoned just right, with a nice big thing of mashed potatoes and gravy on the side, or a loaded baked potato. Mmm. Doesn't get much better than that. See, I love those things, but this isn't the love that God's talking about, right? He doesn't want us to love him with that kind of love because guess what? Once I've eaten that food or I've watched that football game, guess what? I don't need another one until either the next meal or the next Saturday. That's not the kind of love that God is talking about. He's not talking about a love that is fleeting or goes away, one that is just when we want it to happen. That's not the love that he is talking about here. As we read through, it says, Listen, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. How else are we supposed to love him? Love him with all of our soul. How else are we supposed to love him? With all of our strength. You see, the reason God gives these three reasons and these three manners in which to love God, it's not because it's just, hey, I'm going to give him three reasons or three ideas of how to love me the right way. No, 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 that's not it. The reason God tells us to love him with all of our heart and all of our soul and with all of our strength is because if you think about it, that's every aspect of us. If you think about us, we have different aspects of who we are. We, we have our heart. Those are the things that are internal to us. It's our soul. It's what makes us who we are. And then all of our strength, it's all the activities, all the things that we're physically capable of doing. And if you look at it, those three things encompass everything about you and me. And so God is telling us, you need to love me with everything. Not only with everything, but all the time. Never ceasing, never stopping. It's always continually with everything. I love hunting. I love to go out in the woods and I love to sit there in the fall. I love to hunt deer. I love to hunt ducks. My grandpa was a coon hunter and he taught me a love for hunting when I was growing up. He was a, um, basically a professional coon hunter. He sold dogs for thousands of dollars and he won trophies. He was a world champion about five times. But when I was growing up, my grandfather instilled in me a love for hunting and that's the reason I branched out into deer hunting and duck hunting and 
uh, elk hunting and all those other things that I love to do. But see, that love for hunting only is there probably before the season starts. So at the end of one season and before the next. Now, you may ask me, well, why, Tim, is your love for hunting only there from the end of the season until the beginning of the next or partway through the next? Well, see, I'm not always the most successful deer hunter or duck hunter. And so I get frustrated. And by the end of the season, I'm like, man, this has been a rough season. And I need to take a break from this. But you see, the love for God that we should have for him is not like that deer hunting or not like that duck hunting. It's not that frustrating love that we have when we're going through the season and we haven't gotten anything or we're tired. And then we just give up. And we're like, I don't want to deal with this till a little later. And then when May starts coming, you start scouting again and the fall comes and it's getting close and then deer season starts, you're ready to go. The love of God that we should have for him is not like that. It's something that should always be sought after. It's something that should always be looked to. It is something that we should constantly strive for, our love for him. And that's the correct kind of love that God is giving here. And I want you to notice something. If you read this in verse 4, it says, Listen, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. He's telling Israel exactly who he is so that they can love him correctly. If you go to the Hebrew and look at this, it's literally saying, the Lord your God's is one. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard that before, but what he's referring to is he says, the Lord your God's, the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we are one, and you, two are, you are to worship the holy triune God. And he tells this to Israel right here because he wants them to make sure that they're loving the right God. Because if you remember, Israel had all kinds of gods, right? They worship Baal at some points. They worship the God of the Philistines at some points. And they were always seeking after something else, much like you and I today. But God wants them to worship the one true triune God. And he wants them to love him with all their heart, with all their mind, with all their soul, and with all their strength. As we continue on, you need to see that God's words must be in your heart. Verse 6, it says, these words that I'm giving you today are to be in your heart. So as we look at it from our current perspective here in the United States in the year of 2018, we've probably been taught this since Sunday school, right? I'm supposed to love the guy with all my heart, and I'm supposed to hide his word in my heart, right? So I'm going to learn all my Bible verses, and uh, I'm going to take in as much scripture as I can, and then you hit your 20s and life starts happening, or maybe it's college, and you start putting it away and you don't really memorize as much scripture. You get older, life happens again, you have children, grandchildren, you have a great job, you're busier than you've ever been in your life, and it's very easy to get away from hiding God's word in your heart. And the Old Testament is even tougher than that. Because Israel didn't have a personal copy of scripture for each individual person like we do today. And so some of the things that Israel would do is they would make things to keep God's word with them. And we'll look at that in just a minute. But they had to strive fairly diff difficultly, fairly strenuously to hide God's word in their heart. Because they had to hear it and they had to remember it. And if you look back to the Old Covenant, if you remember the Old Covenant in the Old Testament was God's promise to Moses that he was going to get Israel as his people and they would be his people forever. But there was a problem with that. What was the problem with that? It was that Israel was human and they always went somewhere else. They always sought after something else. And so God then gave them a new covenant. And this was after this verse here. Notice here it says, you need to hide your word in my heart. But he says... In Jeremiah 31, he says, Look, the days are coming, this is the Lord's declaration, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. This one will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when they took them by the hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt. A covenant they broke, even though I had married them. The Lord's declaration instead is this covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days. 
the Lord's declaration, I will put my words, my teaching within them and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. You see, in the Old Testament, God was still calling his people to have his words in their heart, but they were unable to do it because of their humanness and they needed something else. But God provided a new covenant to come where his words would be constantly in their hearts. Now you may ask me, Tim, how, how did all that work out? Well, as you look through scripture and you see the Old Testament prophets, you see all the time that the Old Testament prophets, they have the spirit of the Lord come to them and give them towards the words to write down. We see that with Moses. We see that with Jeremiah. We see that with all the Old Testament prophets. We even see that with the New Testament writers as well. So here's something that I've learned this week that really caught my attention, and I hope it catches yours too. When God promised the new covenant, he was promising that he would write his words on the hearts of his people. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, for all scripture is inspired by God. So we know his entire word is inspired by him. Who is the author of scripture? It is the Holy Spirit. What happens when you and I receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior? He gives us the Holy Spirit to live in us. The author of scripture, if you are a believer, lives inside of you. And as you study your word and as you learn his word, he is helping those things to be written permanently in your heart as you study his word. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that great? Isn't it wonderful to know that we have something the Israelites didn't, which is the Holy Spirit living in us? Because the whole reason we need God's word in us is so that we can do the first part, which is to love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and spirit. You and I cannot love God if his word is not in us and he's provided it all for us. But it's something we have to work on. It's like a marriage. We have to sit down and we have to study God's word. We have to learn it. We have to work on it hard, just like with your wife or your husband. You have to sit there and you have to learn who they are. You have to study them. You have to know what they like and dislike. And in the same way, we have to study God's word and we have to work at it. We have to learn it. We have to put it in our hearts so that the Holy Spirit can teach us those things that we have learned and they can be permanently written in our hearts. And it's great to know that the Holy Spirit lives in us and he is the one that is doing that for us. But it didn't just stop there. So we know that Moses told Israel, you need to love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And you need to hide your word, God's word in your heart. But it didn't stop there. It wasn't just a singular thing that I, I, this is what I have to do and that's it. Right, I go in my closet, I have my prayer time, I sit there, I study God's word, I grow in my walk with him, I hide his words in my heart so that I know what he wants and what he says, and then I'm done. That's not where it stops. You see, there's something else to it. And in the Old Testament, if you think back to your Israel or your Old Testament history, Israel was called by God to be different from all the nations. Remember that? They were supposed to be different so all the nations around them would be attracted to them, right? And in the same way, many of us here today, we think of our walk with Christ. We need to act a certain way so that the nations will come to us, the people will come to us, but that's not the case. Even in the Old Testament, even though that was Israel's primary calling, there's something else that they were supposed to do within their own families. And here's what it was. Keep reading with me in verse 7. It says, repeat them to your children. And what is them? It's the commands of God, the greatest command. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Talk about them when you sit in your house and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Bind them as a sign on your hand and let them be a symbol on your forehead. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. You see, we are to repeat God's words to our children. I'm a huge college football fan. I actually got to go watch my favorite team yesterday, Alabama. Uh, we played Arkansas, and uh, it, was, it was a good game. It was a really good game. Um, but here's the thing. 
That was the first game that I'd ever taken my son to. It's the first Alabama game he's ever been to. But he already is an Alabama fan because since he was born, we've put him in Alabama gear. We talk about Alabama a lot. We watch Alabama play every Saturday. And so over the course of Will's six years, he has constantly been told, you're a Bama fan. This is your team. And if you ask him today, hey, Will, what is your favorite college football team? He will say, Alabama. Now, this is just a silly football team, right? In the grand scheme of things, what does football really do? In the scheme of eternity, what is football? It's not much. But if you think about it, the idea is the same for God's word when it comes to repeating to our children over and over and over again and teaching them over and over and over again about God's word. Notice what the author Moses is telling Israel here. He says, look, you are to talk about God's words and his commands when you're sitting at home. Man, how easy is it for us to come in and just sit down and do nothing but watch TV or go do our chores or something else and never once speak to our children about God's word? I'm guilty of it because when I'm tired and I come home, man, that easy chair looks really good. But God's command is for me to teach my children, and it could even mean teach my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren, anybody who is in my family, I need to be teaching them about God's word. I need to speak with them when I'm at home, when I'm sitting at home. What else? It's when we are traveling. Notice it says here, when you're walking down the road. Now, I don't know about you, but do you guys walk to work anymore? No, we, we drive our cars, right? So we are to speak about God's commands when we are traveling. When we're going from point A to point B and our children are with us, we need to be speaking with them about God's word. Why? Because it's reinforcing his word in their hearts, in their minds, in their lives. Where else are we supposed to be talking about it? We're talking about them when we wake up and before we go to bed. You see, God's word is something that should be flowing out of us. We should be overflowing with what we've been doing privately with the love we have for God, and we should be overflowing with God's word as we're speaking to our families. Why? Because God, if we lose our families, we've lost everything. We are called to reach our families for Christ. As parents, teach your children. As grandparents, teach your children and your grandchildren, or your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren. That is our responsibility because it demonstrates our love for God. You see, this right here isn't just something we do. It's coming from the overflow of our love that we have for Christ. And if we've lost our family, it may demonstrate that we didn't love God the way we were supposed to. We are to love God with all of our hearts, and which should overflow so much that we can't wait to tell our families. And he says this so much, and it's basic, if you look at it, it is every single moment of the day. Every single moment of the day, from the time you wake up till the time you go to bed, you're to be telling your family, your children about God. Isn't that wonderful? God has it set up where it's, quote unquote, easy for us to do it. We have every opportunity. Sometimes it's difficult. And Israel demonstrated that because if you remember, they would come to God and then they would start sinning and they'd go away from God and God would punish them and then they'd repent and they'd come back and then they'd sin again and they'd be dispelled and they'd come back and it was just a cycle and it was almost always because they weren't teaching the next generation about God. It always said the new generation would come up and they'd forget about God. Well, how did they forget about God if Israel was doing this? The answer is they wouldn't have. But the parents were not teaching their children. In the New Testament, God changes. Instead of the whole world coming to us, we're supposed to go out. Matthew 28 is a great commission, and instead of just teaching our families now, we're to go teach everybody else. You and I, in the same way as the Israelites, where our responsibility is to not just teach our families anymore, but it's to teach any person we come into contact with about God and about his word. And it all comes from our love for God. There's one more thing that God told Israel to do, and this is just something that would be easy to do. 
Notice at the end, I already read it, but it says, bind them as a sign on your hand and let them be a symbol on your forehead. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Not only was Israel to be constantly learning God's word, but they needed reminders about God's word. I don't know about you, but I forget a lot. You can ask my wife. She'll ask me to do something, and then I'll come back a little bit later, and I've been busy doing something else, and I've completely forgotten what she asked me to do to get it done. And God knows that as humans, we will have the same problems, and he knew Israel had the same problem, and he did something. He told them something to make sure that they wouldn't forget about him and his commands. And here's what he says. The first one is to bind them as a sign on your hand. So they would, the Israelites still do this today if they're Orthodox Jews. They will get uh, a bracelet or a ring and they will keep that on their hands so that as they're doing things throughout the day, they are reminded of God's word. Think about it. Every single thing that you and I do, we use our what? We use our hands. So as you are working, as you're texting on your phone, as you are washing your hair, as you are, whatever it is that you're doing, your hands are involved in it, and you are to be reminded of God's words through that. The Israelites were. They were also to wear a frontlet, and basically what this was was like a little tassel that they would attach to their hair or to their hat, and as they were moving throughout the day, these tassels would constantly hit them in the head. Man, that would be really annoying, wouldn't it? To remind them about God's word. What else were they to do? They were to put them on the doorposts of their house. If you go to many hotels in Israel today or many homes in Israel today, you will see God's commands written on the doorposts of the house. Why is that? Well, as you are entering and leaving your home every single day, you're to be reminded of God's word. They were also to keep God's words on the gates of their homes. Why? Well, as you're entering and leaving your house, you're reminded in your gates, you're being reminded of God's word. But not just that, as your neighbors are walking by, and as the visitor from another country is coming by, and as the children of the neighborhood are walking by, everybody is reminded about God's word and God's command and this great command of loving God with all your heart and your mind and your strength. Now, this is a command for Israel, but it's probably a good command for us too because I have a phone and when I forget things, I have a problem. And so I use my phone to put in my calendar, I need to do this thing at this time, and it sends me a reminder. I need to do this other thing at this other time, and it sends me a reminder. Just in my humanness, I need constant reminders to make sure I get things done. How much more to remind myself to love God? We need things in our houses to rem help us remember God. Help us to remember to love him with all of our heart, with all of our soul, and with all of our strength. And here's the key. God wants us to be obedient to him, but we cannot be obedient to him if we do not love him. That's why Jesus, when he's asked by the Pharisees, they come to him in the New Testament. I'm reading from Matthew, and it says the following, excuse me, I'm reading from John 14, and it says that the Pharisees came to him and they asked him, they said, what, what, what's the great command? They're trying to trap him. And he says, the greatest command is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second greatest command, you only asked me for one, but the second one is like unto it, you need to love your neighbor as yourself. It wasn't about obedience. It wasn't about doing things for God. It was about loving God. And that's because if we are to be obedient to God and to keep his commands the way he has asked us to, we have to have our hearts attuned with his, and that means we have to love him. And he's helped us do that by giving us him already to live in us. Remember it says he, we love him because he first loved us? It's demonstrated by him giving us the Holy Spirit. We can love God correctly because he's already given us the Holy Spirit. But we have to put him first. We have to get the other things out of our lives that aren't correct and put him first. So here's my question for you today. Do you love God?
It's easy in our minds to say, yeah, I love God. That's not my question. Do you really love God the way it says in his word that we must love him? Do you love him with everything that you have? Do you love him with all of your time that you have? Do you love him with all the strength that you have? Do you love him with all of your abilities that you have? Do you love him with literally everything about you? Do you love him with all of that? Because that's the way God wants us to love him. He doesn't want part of us. He doesn't want most of us. He wants all of us. So do you love God the way he wants you to love him? Are you constantly hiding his word in your heart? Are you constantly memorizing? And I'm preaching to myself here. Are you constantly memorizing God's word? Because that's how we demonstrate we love him. Do we constantly teach and repeat God's word to our children from the time they wake up until the time they go to bed? Because the majority of our children and our grandchildren, by the time they leave high school, they will never come back to church. Just like Israel, when the generations changed, the generations that followed forgot about God, our children right now in the United States of America, the majority of them are demonstrating exactly that, that they are forgetting God and they never come back. And it comes back to us and our love for God. It all stems from that. Do we love God the way we are supposed to love God, which is being obedient to his word and giving him everything? That's how you and I are to love God. Are you doing it? God teaches us and he molds us and he wants us to love him with everything because he is everything. Only he gives us hope. Only he gives us a hope of eternity. Only he mends relationships. Only he can do so many things that we cannot. And it all stems him working in us through our love for him. Do you love him? We're going to pray, but if God is working in your life and you need to make something right, you realize today that you have not loved God the way you're supposed to, Today is a time to change that, to tell God, I want to love you with everything. And Lord, I've been disobedient and I have not loved you with everything and I am going to change that today. And if that's you, you can come forward and you can tell that to God. You can tell that to God in your seats, but when you come forward, you're letting everybody else know that God is doing something in you and we can hold you accountable to that. Some of you may not have any love for God at all because you do not believe in him. And this is your opportunity to say, God, I've been running from you. I have put you behind me. I've never wanted to have any part of you, but today I want that to change because I need you in my life. I need the Holy Spirit living in me. Above all else, I need to love you because I've tried loving everything else and nothing else works, and I need to love you with everything that I've got. If that's you today, you need to receive Jesus in your heart as your personal Lord and Savior. And we as a church will come around you and teach you God's word so that you can hide it in your heart, so you can love him, and you can repeat that to your children as well. So as we stand and as we sing, we're going to have a time of offering or a time of, of invitation. And if you need to work with God, if you need to tell God of your sin and you need to repent, if you need to ask God to help you to love him, with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. Right now is the time to do it. You come.